Gentlemen, uh, welcome here to uh, Scutton. For those of you online, we are gathered in uh, Scutton in Oslo. Um, most of us avoid going into tax offices, but uh, I think um, it's providing us with a very nice uh, venue today. And we're trying something a little hybrid, uh, both uh, in person, uh, appropriately distanced, uh, and also uh, online for those of us who are able, for those of you who are able to um, join us, welcome on behalf of the British Embassy Oslo and UN Global Compact Norway. My name is Richard Wood. I am the British ambassador uh, to Norway. Uh, this is an issue which the British government feels um, very passionate uh, about, and we wanted to bring you a little bit of our experience and stimulate discussion uh, with Norwegian partners about what we might do uh, more of uh, in this area. Um, of course, we're all faced with the crisis around uh, COVID-19 at the moment. Um, but what I always say to people is there are some global issues that simply cannot wait until uh, COVID is sorted, until we have a vaccine and we've brought it under control. There are some issues which we have to understand, we just have to tackle in parallel. And climate change is one of those issues that simply uh, won't wait. We've had to, unfortunately, uh, because of the nature of the event, uh, cancel COP26 uh, this year uh, and postpone it until next year. Those things work best when people are, uh, when you can lock them in rooms together and force them to thrash out solutions to uh, issues. Uh, and I don't think that would work over Zoom quite so well. So we will do that next year. The good thing about that is it's given us time now to build a bit of momentum around some of the um, uh, key issues. And we know that common action is absolutely vital uh, if we're going to bring down um, temperature change, temperature rises below 2% uh, and avoid catastrophic, uh, perhaps irreversible uh, climate change. And I mean common action between states, businesses and individuals where everybody around the world understands that this is their issue, uh, feels they have a stake in it and is prepared to commit to common action. Um, so that action um, by businesses, states and individuals around the world not only will uh, contribute to a comprehensive uh, plan of action around climate change, it will also bring around the benefits of addressing these issues much faster. Um, I think that we all feel that we can, uh, through this common action, bring around zero emissions uh, technology development faster, we can increase economies of scale, uh, and we can bring down costs of innovation much more quickly. And faster opportunities will give all countries the ability to share uh, in the benefits of clean growth, and that has been a particular sticking point in the arguments around climate change uh, up until now. It's their problem. Uh, when they fix it, um, then uh, they can tell us how to do it. Or we shouldn't move forward if other countries are not prepared to. Common action, fast solutions, shared benefits will help unlock some of those uh, benefits. And you know, what are we um, looking at in terms of benefits? Secure energy, cleaner air, which is a big issue in more places than uh, in Oslo, less of an issue, but in many parts of the world, um, serious issues, health issues, development issues from uh, polluted air. We will have a more resilient environment, uh, a safer climate, and also contribute to stopping a reduction in our biodiversity in the world. So um, it's really important that we collectively understand um, that green uh, does not come at the cost of growth. Uh, we can have both, uh, and we tell people that in the UK since 1990, we have reduced um, emissions by 40% at the same time as growing the economy by two-thirds. Uh, you don't have to sacrifice growth uh, in order to have uh, a greener uh, policy around um, climate change and all of the different areas involved. Um, why should people uh, get on board? Because I think the right investment solutions can create jobs and wealth at the same time as cutting emissions and contributing to a safer, uh, safer environment. Um, and importantly, climate action also reduces long-term risk uh, to business. Uh, the uncertainty around destroyed environments um, and 
um, loss of biodiversity and many other issues creates long-term risk for many businesses and a secure uh, investment future in, in innovation towards reversing climate change will reduce long-term risk. So why are we talking as the British government about um, green finance? I know it's called sustainable finance. I use green finance as a bit of a shorthand, but uh, sustainable is probably a better, uh, a better term. So I think the transition that I've tried to describe that we need to go through um, will actually have uh, unprecedented changes in how we uh, invest, how we measure risk, and how we assign value in the economy in the future. Um, it's estimated that at least $6 trillion per annum of new or reallocated infrastructure investment up to 2030 will be required to meet the Paris uh, Climate Agreement targets and for the wider sustainable development goals. Uh, we have the opportunity and the need to make sure uh, that that investment climate uh, is achieved in a way which contributes itself um, to those goals. Um, I think that means that the long-term transition to net zero, uh, resilient and environmentally sustainable global economy uh, will require unprecedented changes to the global financial flows. Um, for our work on the finance strand of COP26, the UK's financial and regulatory institutions are undertaking what I think is pioneering work. Uh, through the city, uh, we call, city of London is different than the city, I'm talking about the UK's entire um, financial infrastructure, which is across the whole country, uh, and partnership in our regulatory and supervisory approach, uh, and through our influence at the international uh, financial institutions, we are aiming to accelerate the greening of our global financial system. We also want to show how the climate finance commitment we're advocating can help accelerate this shift. Now, COP conferences, uh, and all international negotiations are about convincing the world of the need to act and then negotiating commitments uh, for national action which can be uh, monitored and measured. Um, finance is key to delivering a, so a successful negotiating package. That's why we've included it as one of our four main strands of our COP26 presidency. We need to show that increased ambition can be financed and that support to developing countries is also uh, stepping up to meet the challenge. Uh, and key to that for us in developed countries uh, will be demonstrating that we are meeting the $100 billion annual climate finance goal and will contribute uh, to increasing support to developing countries to help meet those goals. Now, achieving the, the Paris objective of stabilizing the climate at less than a two degree uh, increase requires a whole of economy transition. Every company, every bank, every insurer and investor will have to in adjust their business models, develop credible plans for the transition and implement them. Um, our goal at this event is to describe some of the work in more detail and to enlist Norway uh, and its business and financial institutions as advocates for ambitious change. Together with the UN Global Compact Norway, we've brought some leading experts together uh, today to discuss this issue and create uh, a little bit of momentum around the issue in Norway. Now, Norway brings great innovation to the table. Um, the UK's energy shift uh, is not going to be possible without Norway's investment, uh, both in technology uh, and in operation. Um, so, Norway has a great innovative uh, track record in um, transformative technology and innovation. And what the UK, I think, offers is financial know-how as the world's most important finance hub. He would say that, wouldn't he? Um, our asset management sector has uh, $9.1 trillion uh, of assets under management, a global share of 18% of all cross-border bank lending, you know all these things, and a stock exchange um, with 500 international companies from more than 70 countries. We believe that is a really good starting place to harness the financial industry um, to become a, a partner on this uh, journey. And I can tell you that our experience shows that this focus creates a change in mindset and real action. Um, decarbonization is well on the way to becoming totally mainstreamed uh, in the UK across all economic activity. 
In clean energy alone, we've invested £92 billion, uh, and we've created around 400,000 jobs in the low-carbon economy. It shows that you can have progressive climate uh, policies and create wealth and create jobs. Uh, it takes investment uh, and vision from a government in partnership with the private sector. So um, that's really it from me, um, because I'm not an expert. I'm looking forward to hearing from the experts. Um, but I just wanted to um, give you a few introductory words and set out why we think this is so important, both for the UK and for Norway, and why we have uh, very complementary things to bring to uh, this discussion. Um, so uh, with that, I will hand you over to our moderator for the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I think we will hand over the word um, right away to uh, Sir Roger uh, Gifford. Is he online? Yes, okay. We'll have him up on the screen real soon, I hope. <laughs> so Roger, can you hear us? I can hear you, can you see me? We can see you and now we can also hear you, I think. Is it possible to turn the volume up a notch? Thank you. Okay, so I'll just uh, leave the word to um, Sir Roger uh, Gifford. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just trying my own volume a little bit higher. Is that, how does that uh, sound and look? I can't see the end of the screen, but it's uh, great, to, great to know that you're all there. Um, could I just have a thumbs up from somebody on the uh, side to say it's working? That looks good. Not sure about that. Okay. Very nice to see you all and how are you at this event. I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to ask you to turn your sound off at you and getting feedback. If that could be arranged. I think that's, as long as you hear me, that's good. Um, when I came to Oslo in January, just after the Davos meeting, I said that in the four years since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, the market had grown at an annualized rate of nearly 20%. And we said that BlackRock predicts that ESG exchange-traded funds will grow to $400 billion in a decade. The change in approach has been very noticeable in Europe, and especially so in some parts of Scandinavia, and in the international investment market in London. And if anything, that is accelerating as a result of the pandemic. Morningstar estimates that well over $50 billion flowed into ESG funds in the first half of 2020, and that compares with global outflows from the broader fund landscape of almost $400 billion. ESG funds are likely to see over a $100 billion rise by the third quarter. As one investment director at AJ Bell said, ESG used to be seen as a bit of a bull market luxury. I don't think it's going to work out that way going forwards. And this is focusing on responsible business generally, not just the environment. This is almost certainly due to COVID and its effects on different parts of society, starting with the poorest and the least well. On July the 3rd, the clothing company Boohoo, based up in Leicester, its share price was 387 pence. An article run two days later by the Sunday Times focused on their work practices in Leicester, and the price fell to 225 pence, with other major sellers joining the rush. Almost two billion pounds wiped off its five billion pound market value in just a week as a result of bad social practices. So corporate behavior and how it translates into social is a very hot topic. And I want to look just briefly at three questions with you. Why are investors moving into ESG? What does the rise of ESG mean for corporates? And what's next? Can I have a thumbs up from the host just to check it's all coming over okay? Yeah, great, thanks for the thumbs up. Let me also say that the timing of this conversation is really good. All the governmental talk, as we've heard from Richard, 
And if that is carried out, it's going to be the ESG sector that can be a clear beneficiary. And this conversation is important because investors drive markets and investor drive the investors drive the corporate growth which affects so much of our lives. If, ES if investors don't drive this, it's not going to happen. So firstly, why are investors moving into ESG? And I would say as they're smelling the coffee. It's a bit obvious to point out how badly brown energy is a few months, prompting many people to point out the better performance of ESG portfolios just in the last few months, those that avoid oil companies. It's a much longer trend than just that. ESG funds have outperformed non-ESG in recent years. Morningstar released a survey in June of 745 sustainable funds in Europe, which showed 60% did better than non-sustainable over three, over five, and over 10 years. And there was a markedly higher availability amongst sustainability funds. It proved to many that performance penalty is a myth. And with this is the rise of the reality of climate change. It's not always rec recognized that environmental risk comes in two forms. Physical, well-known to insurance companies, risk of forest fires, increased flooding, desert formation, coastal erosion, and so on. Much more relevantly for most of us is political or transition risk. No one saw automobile companies as climate risk stocks until governments decided diesel engines weren't good for a climate conscious future, like you in Norway. You're lucky you don't have a non-electric major auto sector, I think. Jaguar Land Rover in the UK wrote off the best part of £4 billion and is still struggling with the consequences of that political decision. Most auto manufacturers are in a similar place. And if we were to introduce a political €75 Euro carbon tax across the EU, you know, and how do we take that into account? Extra cost for some big carbon users, not so much for others. Norway already in a good position here with the carbon tax, like Sweden, which has the highest in Europe, highest in the world, I think, at 110 euros, the UK less so. And with government pressure building, it's a perfect storm for the environmental agenda. Yes, ESG policies and strategies are a rising phenomenon, a bit like... CSR. And social responsibility for granted today. Not about looking good. This is about making better returns. It's, if it's not aiming at a better yield, we've got the risk analysis wrong. Whether you want better yields or an effective hedge against other parts of your portfolio. Secondly, strategies means corporates are really to shareholders, they have employees. And they are finding that ESG strategies fit the narrative, a bit like CSR policies did. They also hear the demand from the public, from the media, from politicians for better corporate sourcing policies, for cleaner material production, for greater accountability in their non-financial operations. In civilised countries like Norway and the UK, you can argue that social practice is already world leaders in the UK. And then there is the new question of where resources are sourced, whether through mining or agriculture. We live in a world of almost infinite internet information. There is nowhere to hide an inconvenient reality. Specifically on the environment and carbon, we are all bound by the Paris 2015 Agreement with net zero targets, which have profound implications for all industry. And the announcement by PP just last week, it intends, it intends to become a mixed energy company with net zero targets, following in the footsteps of also Denmark and the Ecuador of Norway. This is significant in France. Microsoft earlier this year, zero company, both directly and in its electoral consumption. That's a strong message to investors as well as consumers. So it really is no longer optional not to have a transparent climate strategy. And at the end of it all, it's about jobs and growth, as the ambassador pointed out earlier. So lastly, what's next? Well, we Norwegians and Brits share a lot. We intermarry for generations, so same things. We clearly find each other attractive. We love shipping. And we love oil. We love fish too. Whilst we in cracked flirt 
but in business, we see Norway as our best, expect lots of warmth and good relationships. Ambassador Richard, this is going to be a golden period for you and your excellent team. A big music fan and Grieg and Ola Gielo and Christian Sinding are among the best. And I knew Knutnisha personally. And I admire Tina Helset, Leif Anseness and many others. So often they're in the music context for me. In the context of... Both the UK and Norway are heavily committed to oil and gas. And this has given us both a little guilty conscience when we think about how we invest. BP and Shell and many other oil sector players are just too important to our pension funds to ignore. It's not a secret either that there is a difference between London as a global financial centre, managing international and the day sterling investment market, which is much more conservative in this respect. The International Finance Centre London is, I would say, a finance and e there are over 250 foreign banks. $10 trillion of assets. I think it's gone up since the ambassador spoke earlier. S is this. The domestic UK sterling pensions are more like what I made the for obvious and good. This also gives rise, I would say, healthy cynicism, doubts about new sounding investment strategies which threaten our returns. Getting out of the very stocks that have stood us so well that COVID is changing that. I would say institutions are really smelling the coffee, studying the tea leaves, and reading the smoke signals. Staple favorite stock for every pension fund in the country, BP changing strategy. It's time to sit up and listen. I emphasize again. This is not about taking on ESG just because it's a good thing to do. It's about making better returns. Good thinking corporates are going to consume government and employee sentiment. Lastly, let me say that com some commentators want us to drop the ESG label. I have some sympathy with that, and I have always wanted to separate E from the SG. The E has carbon metrics we can measure the good corporate practice to be worked on. And maybe it will become so much the norm anymore. So there is an opportunity for Norway to devise its own system of new carbon and personally transitions as being a key area going forwards. We could think about what that means and work on it. Is it light green or fairly orange? Like the TK tank? This deal that we led earlier classified it as maybe the color to the strategy of the stock in question, and we can verify it. Let's work on this. In conclusion, we are seeing something of a virtual cycle when it comes to environmental investing. Diamond of science, so far as we can predict it, investors, the public, and global organizations, such as the UN Global Compact, make ESG a great vehicle for corporates and investors alike to have this discussion. It's back to the old phrase, what gets measured gets done. Measurement and change, we believe, needs to get done. Thank you, and back to you. Thank you, Sir, uh, Sir Richard. Um, sorry for the technical problems. Uh, at least we heard some of the relevant questions you raised, and we will get the possibility to, to discuss them uh, even further now in the upcoming panel uh, discussion. Uh, Sir uh, Richard, Sir Roger, sorry, you will um, stay with us online, hopefully. Um, and I would like to welcome the other panelists on stage. So please welcome uh, Kim Gabrieli from UN Global Compact, Ida Kreutzer from Finance Norway, Investor Jens uh, Ulfvet Mo, and uh, Ylva Lindberg from Norfund. I think we, yeah. One meter. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the distance. Okay, so thank you all for joining um, this discussion. I hope you heard uh, some of the, the questions uh, that were uh, raised in the 
presentation. Um, and first of all, Kim, can you tell us um, the big question? Is Norway lagging behind in the area of green finance and sustainability? I think perhaps there are more people in this uh, panel that can answer that from a financial side better than me. Uh, but I think the perceived um, answer to that is, is that there is a, we are lagging behind. We are lagging behind the UK on green and sustainable finance. Uh, we are lagging behind some of our other uh, neighbour countries, like the Netherlands, having a sustainable finance platform. And I'm not talking about the, the private side of things in that sense. I'm talking about the cooperation uh, with the government. So how do we publicly uh, create, uh, I think he's just said, the sort of common action, I think was what's what uh, um, the ambassador was saying. So how do we create that common action? It's great that uh, Finance Norway and all the members have already come up with a roadmap on how to work on, on the future of finance. Uh, but where is the government? Where is the public side? Uh, how can we much stronger uh, work together on such a thing like the, the UK has done? Put together a task force, make a national strategy, discuss if there is a need for either developing further the, the tools we already have or looking to some sort of an investment bank or is perhaps Innovation Norway, that in green investment bank, who knows? Uh, or even Nysna. But I think these are the discussions that are perhaps there, but not strong enough amongst the politicians. So that is at least one of our wishes, is to, to create a more, um, uh, you know, a strong uh, front from the politicians to, to look at this. And this is not an ideological discussion. We see that both Labour, Conservative and Green governments over the northern part of Europe are doing this, creating in national initiatives. There's no reason why either the current government or government that come could do that also in the Norwegian context. Mm. Okay, we will discuss the collaboration between UK and Norway uh, a bit later on. But Ilva, I want to ask you first, uh, what are the biggest challenge as you think? Do you represent the Nordfen, which invests in developing countries yeah. and uh, sustainable projects, right? Yeah, so uh, North Fund is the Norwegian government's investment fund for developing countries. So we are fully owned by the government. So in one sense, a government initiative do, doing what you're talking about, but in a certain part of the world. Uh, and let me just say first, I think uh, Sir Roger uh, gave a very compelling introduction on the development that we've seen in ESG where uh, you know, we've seen a significant growth in ESG, we're seeing net zero commitments from companies. And going back, when I started in the sustainable finance space about 20 years ago, you, know, you might get a kind of five minute chunk at the Christmas lunch talking about ethical mm -hmm. investments. So you know, we've come a very, very long way. Uh, and I'm also encouraged by Sir Roger's reflections that you know, ESG is not a bull market luxury, I believe is the way we, he put it, which I think is encouraging, and I hope that's right. But if we look at this from a developing country perspective, I'm a bit more pessimistic, uh, because what we've seen uh, in terms of COVID-19 impacts in this part of the world is huge capital outflows. So historic outflows of investments from this part of the world that really needs it the most. And we're talking about a part of the world where one billion people lack access to electricity. And we can't possibly invest in electricity that is not green, because then we won't be able to reach the Paris goals. So, you know, we know that there is an enormous financing gap. We know that the need is there. And the reason why it's not happening in this part of the world is really cost of capital. So cost of capital has come significantly down in our part of the world to sort of exaggerate a little bit, you know, it's not that difficult to get finance for renewables projects in the West. It's incredibly difficult in our part of the world because cost of capital is, is too high. Uh, in renewable energy investments require incredibly high upfront costs, but once they're up and running, basically you get the energy for free, right? So these costs are prohibiting really competitive solar and wind projects from just not happening. And what we're seeing instead is that we're building coal-fired power plants in this part of the world. They'll be around for 20 or 30 years, and that's the, the real challenge. So cost of capital to finance essentially competitive projects in this part of the world, that's where the challenge lies. Mm. Um, are you of the same opinion, Idar? Or the same? <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. And, and if, uh, just to build on what uh, Ylva says, why? 
is the cost of capital high mm. in uh, emerging markets. Mm. It has to do with the understanding of risk and the ability to manage that risk. Uh, and um, the, the, the understanding and managing of risk and pricing of risk is key both to the sustainable transition we are seeing in financial markets right now, but it is also key um, to see the necessary uh, investments in uh, infrastructure in emerging economies. And we have to do two things at the same time. When, when we started off Ulva investing uh, like this 20 years ago, it was based on investment beliefs. Now uh, we are building evidence, so we can do evidence-based investments. And as a consequence, cost of capital for climate investments is falling, uh, and uh, risk adjustment returns are increasing. Mm. Uh, so to be, uh, and, and this is based on reporting, consistency, and, uh, and spending the time uh, necessary to build that competence. Mm. But when, it, when we are talking about emerging economies, uh, there are risks, you might call it the market failures, there are risks private investors are unable to take or unwilling to take. Mm. And that's where we need a much more intelligent collaboration between public sector money mitigating the risks the private sector are, uh, is unable to take. Mm. Uh, and by doing that, releasing private investments uh, into these projects and into this, uh, these economies. Mm. And that's uh, what I think uh, exactly is your, your point. So uh, yes, I do, do agree, uh, and we need to get there uh, fast. And just, just a brief comment to add to that, this is exactly what we're trying to do. And we're succeeding in, in doing it, but we're not scaling enough, right? Mm. So. Norfund has collaborations with Scottex Solar, with the life insurance company KLP, with NL Green Power, in, in uh, an Italian company in India. So this is happening, but it's not scaling sufficiently yet. Yeah. And I think there are two aspects. One is real risk, and players, the development finance institutions, be it Norfund or CDC in the UK, um, we can go in and take a different type of risk, and we can help de-risk for other investors, including mm. private investors. But there is also right. risk perception that's challenging because sometimes you think that the risk is higher than it actually is because you don't have the market understanding or network or intelligence to be able to really decompose and mitigate that risk. So I think it's both real risk that needs to be reduced and perceived risk. And, and by doing that, uh, I mean, if Norfund, um, they, they, they should set up a large fund do, to, to do exactly that. And, and by doing that, being a first mover, uh, you could uh, get private investors into those projects. And by doing that, the projects are suddenly bankable. And then you can gear them so you can have a multiplier on that financing. But we have to work together, private sector, public sector, to make it happen. And that's very, very important. Okay, so now you are uh, talking about uh, some of the the five pillars that is in the, um, the campaign towards uh, COP26, which is um, finalizing global public commitments, reporting, risk management, returns, and mobilization, pointed out, uh, pointed out as very important to be able to drive more money in the green direction. And I want to talk a bit more about at least some of them. Um, you have mentioned a lot about risk management, but can you please tell us a bit more of why it's so difficult to put a price on risk? and why that is um, a barrier for, for moving more money in the right direction. Uh, to, to, to try to make it, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's important to try to uh, uncomplicate things. Yeah. When we are talking about risk, what we are talking about is, is effectively to understand how the cash flow, flow from a commercial activity mm. uh, is affected by, for instance, climate change. I mean, and, 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 and if you run a business where your cash flow is based on carbon emissions, your cash flow will uh, fall uh, if the government puts into place uh, car a carbon tax. That's a risk to you as an investor. So to try to understand all the different factors uh, that can affect long-term cash flow from an activity, that is to understand the risk in a business activity. And that is what the investors are doing now, uh, analyzing all different as aspects of the cash flow from all different uh, commercial activities. And by building that kind of competence, we are able to put a price on that risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we assume uh, that the cash flow will fall uh, after five to, to 10 years, well, the value of that cash flow uh, is, of course, significantly lower mm -hmm. uh, than if you assume that it will, um, that it will grow. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, of course. Do we have uh, with us uh, Sir Roger? Is he still on the line? Because they've done a uh, very solid work yes. on... Um, Hi, are you there? Yes, there are. <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm you. here. I think there's maybe a short time lag, like the like the news bulletins from across the world. But I'm okay. here. <laughs> Great. Uh, but you've done um, a solid work on risk management in the Green Finance Institute, right? Correct. Yeah. So, um, what do you think is the most important uh, thing from that we can learn from from your work when it comes to risk uh, management? We decided this had to be very specific and very segmented. The, 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 the discussion around the climate change and indeed around biodiversity increasing is a global discussion. It involves global players. But the solutions will be very local. The mortgage market, we don't have a green mortgage market in the UK. We don't have a way of easily uh, transforming everything that it has. How do we reach those solutions is a very local issue that we need local UK law to focus on. So when we managed our Green Finance Task Force, it looked at what our problems were and we thought about all the solutions to get there. We formed a coalition of 150 people around the table to look at everyone from house builders through um, planners and regulators through to, through to discussions around much bigger picture things around energy. How do we mobilize capital into areas that we think are both going to be good for the environment, but also particularly good for the economy, good for jobs and growth. And that's going to be different to Norway, which is a very stage, different stage of energy production than it is from the UK. So the first thing the task force did was to identify very clearly what the issues are. There was also, to come back to the comments made by, by, by Norfund earlier, there was an international discussion around this as well in the task force, but it's clearly seen as a very separate discussion which needs its own very important and separate treatment. And I do agree that this is an area that is one of the greatest challenges going forwards post-COVID, where so many countries have been so badly hit and where capital naturally flows away from currency risk, political risk, and economic risk is currently scarce. And where I think there's a very good discussion to be had about the role of the multinational, the MDBs going forwards. Much that they can do in that area, that's why we set them up. They'll come back to that separately. But the task force needs to identify what are the issues that you want to change, how to mobilize capital into, those, capital into those, and then find ways of working with government to do that. And I think we often say the UK is rather behind on, on in, in domestic UK is behind on green finance. But it's a little bit unfair because we had uh, decades of financing wind farms, but we didn't label it as green. It was actually all green finance. We just didn't label it as green. So we don't have a kind of great track record having issued a lot of green finance. But it's, um, there's, still been, there's still been a lot of uh, very good projects happening there. But the issue is to get local, to get very specific and to look at very specific aspects of behavior, of, of electrification of vehicles, of the changing for us, all the gas boilers, 50 million gas boilers in houses around the UK. How do we do that? How do we get people to buy into that? How do we get the government behind it? Very different in Norway, but you may have similar issues around carbon, around energy, around new, new, new power stations and so on, which can be looked at. Great, thank you. Um, Jens, you have actually taken a big risk in uh, green investments <laughs> the last couple of years. <coughs> I have your indeed. experience? I saw early on uh, climate change as the biggest challenge we have as humanity. And I'm chair of CICERO, the Research Institute of Oslo Institute, and my fear has only grown with time. There's no doubt that at the end of this century, we'll have three degrees plus. We have a snowball chance in hell of one and a half or two degrees. So it's clearly this is urgent. My experience for is that you can have that analysis spot on. I saw that there was a crisis coming. I saw that, for example, that solar energy would have a great future. So and it's heavily in the company that was the world leader in making polysilicon, which is the input factor. We have a plant that's uh, one and a half billion dollars. It's today closed down because of the Cold War between China and, uh, China and the US. So here was a correct analysis, both in what was happening in technology. We had the cheap technology in the world. We were winners on all except Trump. So the point is, um, there's a I think um, green energy has had a bigger political risk 
uh, than other investments. A similar thing in Brazil, uh, where uh, the thought was that bioenergy would have a, a premium over fossil fuels. That was on the cards, but then the Labour government came in. They had uh, uh, working class uh, voters, of course, so they subsidized fossil fuels. A another type of political risk. So my point is, it's not enough to identify technological change or the major, you must have the political factor into it as well. With, and, and, and then, in the past 10 years, there's been a big change. As uh, we saw here, the awareness of the danger of not investing green is now considerable, so that investments are coming in in huge amounts. And um, I only wish that I hadn't had that vision 20 years ago, but I only had it two or three years ago. That was <laughs> rather more profitable. So my lesson um, is that not investing in the green future today is a major risk. Investing there is very profitable. It's very dangerous not to do it. But you must look at the entire horizon, and notably on the political one. Being a Norwegian, I live in a country that's a climate laggard. We are waking up now, and we've kicked out of our sleep by the EU. The EU is now easily the leading force in the world on the green change. The major step on that happened two or three weeks ago with the Green Deal and the financing of it. It's incredible what's happening. Every Italian gets 6,000 kroner, financed by 9,000 kroner from the Northern Europe. The only good thing that has come out of Brexit is this. This would not have happened if England had been inside the EU. It hmm. has happened. It's a major step forward. It's a major step for the environment. And it will drag Norway kicking and screaming into a clean future. <laughs> OK, I think all uh, three of you have a comment on this. Ida, will yeah, you start? First of all, uh, I mean, uh, it's a very important lesson about political risk. Uh, and that's why it is so important to put regulation into this. Um, long-term regulation that's predictable so that investors can understand and uh, assume that you have a regulatory environment in which you invest. That's why it's important with EU rules and that's why it's mm. important that we apply to the EU rules. Uh, in addition to that, I think it's important to bear in mind that it's uh, significant technology risk in this kind of investments. Uh, I mean, seen from an environmental point of view, the falling marginal cost on all different uh, renewable energy sources is a good thing. Mm -hmm. For an investor, it's a bad thing. Because, uh, I mean, in any point in time you invest, tomorrow you look stupid because a new technology mm -hmm. has come up that's, that's cheaper, better, and, and, and faster. Mm -hmm. So technology risk is also difficult. But even so... Um, an analysis done by one of the leading investors in Norway uh, just before the summer, looking at price book on so-called uh, sustainable investment options in the Norwegian on the Norwegian Stock Exchange and unsustainable investment op options, uh, found that unsustainable options had a price book around 0 0.5 uh, and uh, sustainable options had a price book up to 10. So one kroner equity co uh, capital was priced at, uh, at 0 0.5 for unsustainable options and 10 times for sustainable options. So it's no doubt that the investor market, they have voted and they have voted yes to sustainable investment options right now. Not without risk. Uh, but it's a clear direction. And if I can just give a couple of examples to, to decompose the understanding of risk, which uh, was the, what you're bringing up, Jens, with uh, the political risk is incredibly important. And I think when we invest in emerging markets, there is a, you know, the, the layers of risks that you're facing when investing in a renewable energy project are substantial. So you have everything from when you're building a wind farm or a solar park, the land rights issue, right? Who's living on this land? Probably there are no documents showing who's got the right to this land and people need to be relocated and so on. So that can take a very long time, right? And the longer time something takes, the higher the risk of you getting paid at the end of it, right? 
And then the second thing that we talked about, which is, of course, that renewable energy projects require high upfront investments, and it takes longer to get your payback. So that's another layer of risk. And then we're often um, investing in countries where governance, governments are weak, where there is a general political risk involved, uh, but also in governments that are heavily indebted. So, for example, in a country like Vietnam, uh, due to restrictions from the IMF, Vietnam can no longer put state guarantees behind PPAs, power purchasing agreements, which means that without these guarantees, of course, investors will see that there's a higher risk. So you've got a number of layers of risks that you need to sort of decompose, understand, and mitigate. But that all drives the cost of capital, and it means that we need different kinds of investors, like the development finance institutions, to go in and de-risk and mobilize others. Hmm. Jimmy also had a comment. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, there is the, so I will talk more about political risk, but of mm -hmm. course, uh, I do s still believe that we have a lot to learn from others. I mean, Norfin is one example of how to, you know, to take on the risk on the financial risk, but there is a lot of other tools being used by other countries, and we still have opportunities to, to develop that further in the Norwegian context. But let me focus on the political risk. So how do we take that down? Uh, there, I mean, let's look to the UK since we are here. They have done at least a couple of things that I think is interesting that we can learn from. First of all, Norwegian develop, development policy have identified partners on development policy. UK has, has identified financial partners, green finance partners in their foreign policy. It's a good idea on the political risk. How to set people from both sides together. The way they have organized this, for example, in, uh, in China, uh, is to um, you know, set down a task force that works for one year, uh, and that comes up with, I think it was 14 ideas of how to, to cooperate. One example, how to make it easier to, to invest in the green bond, the Chinese green bond market. Because there are issues with, um, with language, uh, there are some restraints from the government that could be easily solved, but is political and has some tension to it. And that is the exact sort of discussion that Norway also will need to have if you're going to continue to, to invest in, in other countries. But in order to do that, we also need to sort of get a, a holistic approach from the Norwegian side. And for the moment, uh, I think there is a need of looking yet again to the UK or the Netherlands to have more of a holistic, national initiative. It's great with Norfin, it's great with GIEC, it's great with all the different kinds for the external side, and also in the Norwegian uh, with Investinur and, um, uh, and Innovation Norway. And, you know, it, there's, again, there is a lot of opportunities, but there is still a need to sort of gather the, the, the great forces, like they've done in the UK, uh, around a national strategy on uh, sustainable finance, like the EU is doing on their... Perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps I could come in there just for a moment, yeah. um, um, Ola. As I, I chair the UK, I co-chair the UK-China Green Finance Task Force that you're talking about. Uh, and it has been a very interesting experience, uh, which I'm delighted to share some of the um, uh, some of what we've learned from on that. The the particular bit of work we've come out with is, a, is, is forming the green investment principles of the Belt and Road Project. Yeah. which is now signatory up to 40, some 40 different financial institutions are signed up for, which is intending that all new um, Belt and Road projects will be zero carbon. Now, that's a tall order and their principles, not rules yet, but um, it's, it's certainly a step in the right direction. And we're adding teeth to it by having measurement and, uh, and penalties as well for companies that belong to the principles but don't adhere to them. So uh, I'm... I would be delighted to share more of that experience with you because I think uh, Cicero is just a leader in this field and would be great to have them uh, on board. Yeah, do you have a comment? I, I must have a pitch for the UK as being a conceptual leader in the Green Revolution. Conceptual in the sense that LSE, the Grantham Institute, they introduced this concept of stranded assets very early. Uh, even the governor of the Bank of England was there early. And we see in practice, uh, that the rapid change in, in the UK economy, overcoming political resistance, closing down the coal industry, enormous stranded assets. And I think in the past week or two, we have seen two excellent examples to it. One is Exxon. Exxon is easily the most admired oil company in the world. 
This technology, they're everywhere. They're profitable like hell. Share price has not moved for 10 years. BP came out and said, we do less oil, we do more renewables. Uh, we don't think we make more money of it, but it's the right thing to do. Their share price shot up. The wisdom of the English market is excellent. Mm. <laughs> you, you started by asking, are uh, the Norwegian financial sector lagging or leading the transition? And um, uh, I'm not quite objective in this, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I think it's fair to say that, that Norwegian investors were extremely early uh, in, in moving in the sustainable and, and uh, uh, responsible investing landscape. Mm. Um, and, I th and it's also a fact that the Norwegian financial services sector was the first in Europe to present a comprehensive uh, and rather ambitious uh, roadmap for the entire sector, both insurance, banking, and asset management uh, in investments. And in that roadmap, uh, we invited the government and the public sector to do exactly what you propose. Uh, to put together uh, a task force and develop a sector uh, initiative to work together the financial services sector, uh, Bank of Norway, uh, the uh, regulator and, um, and the government, uh, so that we see to that we use both build and share competence, but also use uh, the common forces uh, as effectively as, as possible. But, but if, you, if you think about it, one of the things that we are somewhat hesitant to do in Norway when it comes to industry policies is to develop strong sector initiatives. We tend to stick to general policy principles. And, I th and, and you can argue for that. If you're an uh, economist, you will argue strongly for that. But if we know that we need to be a cer in a certain place in 2030 at a certain time, I mean, we cannot. Uh, base ourselves on, on general policy principles. We need to base ourselves on the activities that we know will accelerate the change we want. And that is, is exactly what we tried to point out in, in the roadmap. And that is, uh, in my opi opinion, exactly this, the, the, the way that the Norwegian financial services sector is trying to, to develop. And we would very much like to do that together, to, together with the government and, and the public sector in Norway. Mm. And if, if I, I could just um, echo what you were saying about the UK, I think it was a bit of a defining moment when Mark Carney in 2015 gave his speech to Lloyds and talked about climate change as a financial risk and the tragedy of the horizons. That really started to turn people around. So I think that was a, quite the defining moment. And I think he's a bit of a rock star for many people <laughs> who've been in the sustainable finance space for, for many years, such as, uh, such as myself. Um, I think it's also uh, interesting to highlight the good collaboration that the DFIs have. So Norfund from Norway side and CDC in the UK. Mm. We have many co-investments in the clean energy space and we have a joint investment platform doing exactly this. So there are some real practical examples on the ground. And I don't think that would have been possible if we hadn't had, um, you know, uh, owners, be it DFID in the UK or the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Norway, who think long term and allow us to develop these kinds of projects. Mm. Uh, I think it's also important to highlight you know, the things that are not just challenging, but where we things, see things actually working out. Because you're asking, Ellen, you know, what are the barriers and what needs to, to happen? I think one of the things that needs to happen is to showcase when these things go right. Mm. Not just talk about the barriers, but now, Norfund has, since inception in 1997, had an average annual IRR, uh, internal rate of return, of, of 7%, which is comparable to the Norwegian Oil Fund, right? Mm. We have a development mandate, a poverty reduction mandate, but it's working, and it's working in practice, and at scale. So we need to, and I think um, the ambassador asked me, you know, why is this such a well-kept secret? And mm. I'm not sure that I was in a position to answer that, <laughs> but it certainly needs to get out there mm. more often mm. and showcase when it's working in practice and mm. when we're delivering both in terms of climate results, but also financial returns. Mm. Because if we don't do the financial returns, we're never going to move this at scale. And, and you do cooperate closely with the UK, right? Can you tell yes. us a bit more about the, the, the collaboration that you have with the... So we have CDC. several investments with CDC. We have an investment platform in the energy space called Globalec, where we invest in energy projects in Africa. Most of these are renewables. We also do some investments in gas, uh, but most of it is in, uh, in renewables. So that's a very important uh, investment area for Norfund and one where we 
in many of these investments collaborate with, uh, with CDC. Hmm. Yeah. Kim? Yeah, I just want to follow up on, on Nidal because I, I, I do agree um, that we, we have a lot to do on, on sectoral approaches, but uh, what we do see amongst our uh, Norwegian members, uh, 200 of them uh, currently, is also an interest of uh, working sectorally, but on topics, mm -hmm. so on ocean, not necessarily on mm -hmm. uh, energy, because then you get sort of the traditional actors in your in the own sector, right? So in a way, the the way the UK has been working on a more sectoral approach to offshore, um, having a plan for the offshore uh, cooperation uh, across in industries, um, and I do, I do think that. Um, the proposal that the Norwegian Shipping Association on uh, on uh, renewable energy offshore is such an example where they are of obviously contributing, but they are completely dependent on cooperation with others. So that's um, one of the, the, the points I wanted to make. And the other one is uh, what we are discussing very briefly and on a very early level is, is there any possibility to set up, for example, Finance Norway, UN Global Compact Norway, a dialogue or a task force in one un informal task force with the British side, for example, on blue finance. Mm -hmm. To have that sort of dialogue doesn't have to be uh, starting out with an informal one to have a discussion with Norwegian companies, uh, British companies and uh, investors uh, on the blue economy. Mm -hmm. um, and I do believe that looking to the, all the experiences the UK already has on on different kinds of uh, national task force dialogues. That could be a very interesting starting point now going to um, going forward towards the COP26. Uh, mm. Can uh, you have a little bit of come in there? A Sorry? Could I come in there again? Yeah, Sorry for the timeline delay. <laughs> just just to comment, the, the, the Green Finance Institute is first um, its first um, big coalition was around the energy efficiency of buildings. We have lots of old buildings in the UK. We have to retrofit them. The next one we are going to focus on is shipping. And I would say we're already speaking to Kuda Haugen at the Norwegian Chamber of Commerce in London. And I'm sure he would be delighted to bring Norwegian Ship Owners Association in on that. Uh, we're very much seeing it as a cross-border conversation. I can't think of anyone better to work with. But that will be the next major coalition that we or task force that we're going to put together um, or one of the next major task force we put together as to how we can how we can mobilise capital into that. And I think it, just to to build on your point, Kim, it's important that these kind of collaborations are not too general and they're not yes. too sort of principles mm. based and they're not you know they need to be specific enough that we're actually able to see when we're reaching our goals or not. Mm. So yep. I think you're making a very valid point that we need okay. from ha to move from having these kind of general red wine types of discussions on the world problems and what needs to be done and really pin down what needs to happen and then see, are we actually making it happen? Mm. Mm. Uh, Ida, you will get a chance to answer Kim's question. But first, Kim, uh, can you and um, UN Global Compact facilitate such an, um, a task force? Uh, not alone. I mean, that's the whole thing about uh, task force, right? But we have already had dialogue with the Norwegian British, uh, British Norwegian Chamber of Commerce, UK, um, UN Global Compact, uh, UK Embassy, but it's very initial. So I, I do think we can. Uh, of course, uh, it's a discussion how to set it up. Is it do, being done with the Green Finance Institute, a uh, public side in Norway? I don't know. It's very early days. Um, so I. I uh, I don't know if you have the capac capacity alone, but we would certainly contribute to, to see something like that. And just what you were saying, Ulai, uh, this is the, the role we got 11 months ago when we opened the Norwegian office, was our company members and com member companies said, we don't need another talk, talking club, or I don't even know the English mm. word. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, so what we are trying to do is set up action platforms where we gather on five working streams in each of the, the action platforms. We have one on, on Ocean, already been uh, working for s uh, five months now. We have one on Circular Economy that is launching its first report now uh, in September. So we are trying to do... You know, in the circular one, we have already identified 11 uh, solutions that we are looking into to then together with accelerator um, companies and, and environments in, 
in Oslo. So we are trying to take it. Do what Ilva is saying that we don't need another sort of chit chat club. We really need to take it out. And I think that goes for this as well. If you're doing something like that, we could look at how it has been done in other task force where they have been very eager to set up a clear process one year, a uh, certain amount of X and Ys that need to be performed throughout the process. Mm. Idar? Um, you know, um, uh, to build something like this, uh, you need a number of building blocks. Um, and uh, over the last couple of years, uh, the systematic development of the, these building blocks um, um, has performed pretty well. Uh, I mean, uh, the financial services sector has come together. Mm. Very clear ambitions. Uh, the dialogue with the Ministry of Finance is, uh, I would say, uh, surprisingly fruitful. Uh, very dynamic <laughs> uh, and very forthcoming. Uh, and if you read what they say in the public documents, very, very clear ambitions. Uh, the dialogue with um, uh, with um, Finance Tilsyn is improving strongly. Uh, building competences, sharing experiences, uh, and an open, uh, inviting dialogue. The dialogue with the Bank of Norway is, is a good one and, um, and is developing. Uh, when it comes to the international dialogues, we, we have three important ongoing dialogues. One, one is together with our Nordic partners. I mean, we work very closely together with Sweden, Finland, Denmark, uh, Iceland and, 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 and the Baltics. Um, and the Nordics is a power uh, in Europe. Important. When, when we agree, people tend to listen. So, I mean, it's, it's very, very important to build that relationship. And, uh, and we will spend time doing that also going forward, even if we are not a full member. I mean, we are a part of the EEA. Uh, the sec the se so the second dialogue is the EU dialogue. I mean, with everything that has happened, the Green Deal, with the, the taxonomy project, I mean, EU is a defining force uh, in sustainable finance, and we are very close to that. So we set up um, uh, an office in Brussels uh, last year together with our Nordic partners, so we have an ongoing presence being a part of those processes. And the third is UK. And the UK is important to us because of London. I mean, the London-based insurance market has been, is and will be the most important uh, global insurance market. Uh, and the, lo the, the financial market, uh, London as a hub, city of London, is the most important for the Norwegian financial services sector. And I must say, uh, the, the embassy, the British embassy to Norway and the, 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 British, uh, the Norwegian British Chamber of Commerce has been very active. Uh, in developing these kind of relations. And we are members of a number of different uh, committees that, that work together. So the building blocks are getting there. Uh, and uh, I hope that we very soon are ready to launch uh, a green finance initiative. That could be something that could take this uh, even a step, uh, a step further. Important, and, uh, and the work that's being done by, by our friends in the UN Global Compact is, is excellent, and, and we have an open and very good dialogue on this. Yeah. That's good to hear, but what is crucial to get from the good initiatives to the real action that you... Mm -hmm. No, the, the real action, you know, that, that, that where, where is the real action happening? It's happening in the boardrooms in 240 financial institutions in Norway. Mm. I mean, that's where the decisions are made, being made. So let's not confuse these uh, high-level initiatives to decision-making. I mean, decision-making is happening in the boardrooms. So, but these initiatives are important as drivers, setting mm. ambitions, sharing competences, uh, developing processes to interact with the members. Uh, but if you have these initiatives without having the members with you, mm. then nothing will happen. No. So that's what I mean when... Uh, and, and if the financial services sector is moving and the Ministry of Finance is sitting back or Finance Tilsyn is sitting back, nothing will happen. Mm. So we need to move together. Mm. Uh, and that is exactly what, what we are meaning by building the building blocks. Mm. And, um, and um, I'm pretty optimistic about uh, what we will achieve. If we go to, to the decision makers, either and the decisions that are made, on a general level, I think it's uh, fair, but perhaps not very diplomatic to say that we've got huge amounts of money sloshing around in our part of the world mm. for very little return, right? That's what mm. we're doing. And we're not doing our future pensioners any fa favours because we're not getting the returns that we need in order to cover future benefits. Mm. 
And at the same time, we see that there is an enormous need for investment, but also attractive investment opportunities in emerging markets. So why do we have this huge pool of capital basically sloshing around, not doing very much in terms of returns, where we could potentially move it to a part of the world that really needs it, where capital is actually going the wrong way because it's going out of these markets instead of into these markets? So I think what we really need to do is, and you spoke about this initially, is to see, can we look at some sort of way of using the, the competence and the network that players like CDC and Norfund has to really be able to catalyze more money into this part of the world? Mm -hmm. And by doing so, we can, we can then de-risk, we can move money to where the need is and where the returns are and where we can actually really build a green future, not just in our part of the world, but also in, in this part of the world. Mm. So kind of unlocking that key, I think, is uh, un unlocking that, finding the key to doing so, I think, is essential. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jens, uh, did you have a comment <laughs> to what Ida was saying? One comment is you said the power is in the boardroom. No, the power is with the consumer and the power is with the voters. And the consumer exercises a large power, notably in the finance sector. And you see the response there is very strong, pushing the finance sector into ethical investments. I think that is really the greatest force there is for change on the climate side. On the voters, you see it in the EU. In order to be elected uh, uh, president of the commission, they really had to change the commission quite a bit on push from the, from the European uh, Parliament into a green future. So the pressure has come, both cases come from below. And I think the essence then is for us to try to make people understand the climate challenge and what they can do and must do and how incredibly dangerous it is to ignore it. I think our time is, is uh, running up. I only have one final question. And Kim, you'll get the last word. What is the most important thing we can uh, learn from UK? To come together around green, fin green and sustainable finance on a more systematic matter. Do you all agree, agree on it? Or anything to add? That's a very important lesson. Uh, and we, we, we are learning a lot more. Uh, but that's a very, very important lesson. I agree. And then I think I'll be looking forward to seeing both what the UK and Norway can bring to the table at COP26. Yep. You know, how can we collaborate and uh, play our role to really step up and, um, you know, make these negotiations, put, 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 put in the finance needed to make these negotiations successful. Mm. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, I think we all are. Okay, so our time is up. Thank you all for joining the panel, for you being here and for uh, you guys listening in. I don't know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we'll hopefully meet again at COP26 next year. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you.